What's up guys, we are back to check out the new Ambernick RG40XXV, which, if the name sounds familiar, you're right, because it's literally the vertical version of the RG40XX horizontal version we checked out a few weeks ago. That being said, this handheld comes packed with some welcome adjustments, and I've really enjoyed gaming on this thing for the past week, so let's jump right into it. The unboxing experience is as you'd expect if you've unboxed any of the Ambernix steady release of handhelds this year, complete with the little manual I didn't read and the classic USB type A to C cable, which if you don't already know you probably want to use this instead of a C to C cable as a uh Ambernic devices tend to like charging on A to C. Taking a look at the specs, this guy's rocking the same 4 inch 480p IPS screen that the H had, as well as the H700 quad core ARM Cortex A53 chip at 1.5 gigahertz. And yes, that's the same chip that the H and the SP and a number of them are sporting, but we'll get to why that's a good thing later. It's got that dual core Mali G31 MP2 GPU, one gigabyte of LP DDR4 RAM, Bluetooth 4.2, Wi-Fi that supports five gigahertz AC bands, and a 3300 milliamp Battery. I'm actually going to set this down before I drop it somewhere. It also has the typical Ambernic Mini HDMI out port on the top, which is ideal placement if you want to connect this up to a TV and use the handheld as a sort of controller in that docked position. Looking at the design of the console, it is, as the name suggests, rocking a vertical orientation. And focusing on that screen, first you'll notice that those bezels are delightfully small, so the screen is almost an edge-to-edge -edge display on this form factor, which makes the 4-inch display feel even bigger while playing. The D-pad and buttons feel super nice, and I'd venture to say they're rank in the Super Nintendo Gamepad S tier for me as far as that rollable mush click ratio goes very scientific. One notable difference from the H is that we only have one thumbstick over here on the left, but I'm pretty sure I'll only notice this on select PS1 games, since pretty much all PS1 games can be played without joysticks. And on N64, I really only expect a thumbstick on the left side, as long as I have a way to hit the C buttons, which we'll get to in a sec. RGB on the joystick is configurable, and I've chosen this chase the light mode, which is pretty cool. There does appear to still be that cardinal snapping on the joystick, meaning that it snaps to the farthest point of the direction it's mounted in, but I honestly don't really mind, as hardly any of the games I want to play on this handheld were designed with joystick sensitivity in mind. However, if it is a concern of yours, there's a patch potentially available, or at least in the works, by a developer named The Gamma Squeeze, which appears to fix the cardinal snapping on these H700 devices. On the right side, it's got a mono speaker, and over on the back we'll find our L and R sets of triggers, which you'll notice have been curved to be more ergonomic and naturally reachable while playing, and this design choice alone makes me super pumped about this handheld, and I can confirm that, at least for me, it does feel super nice to hold with that curved design on the back and the handheld feels very well balanced during gameplay. Speaking of gameplay, let's talk about performance and the default out-of-the-box settings on this handheld. Taking a look at Game Boy first, the Game Boy bezels are perfect, the BIOS is included for that lovely boot animation, and the color palette and overlay are all preset to get that perfect DMG experience, and to drive that point home, we'll put my actual DMG next to the V, and ironically enough, the bezels look better on the V since my Game Boy has lost its faceplate over time. It's worth noting that most, if not all, other consoles have a lovely preset bezel in the firmware, so thank you Ambernick, as I am a fan of bezels, but if you're not a fan, you can always turn them off in one shot using the little toggle function in the apps folder. Jumping into some gameplay, I've never heard of or played the Adventures of Star Saver, but after randomly choosing it from the list of ROMs, I found it's a super fun space platformer, and was a great way to showcase the preset DMG styles on the V. And of course, because we can run our Windows 98 simulator Game Boy game, check out that video if you missed it, we absolutely should play Windows 98 Solitaire on this thing. Speaking of Game Boy games created in 2024, here's a little sneak peek at something in the works. Subscribe to find out more. Moving over to Game Boy Advance, let's take a side-by-side -side look at the RG40XXV next to my recently upgraded GBA screen. Check out that video if you missed it. And although the GBA got a huge upgrade from its original screen and can even do AV out now, the V of course still wins with its gorgeous 4-inch IPS screen and can also do HDMI out. Heading into N64 emulation, the out-of-the-box settings were great for Wave Race, which plays at a consistent 50 FPS. However, the same was not true for Super Mario 64, which required me to switch the GFX plugin to Glide 64 and the RSP plugin to HLE, which then fixed the window glitchiness we saw when testing the H. But then on Super Smash Bros, I needed to switch away from the default parallel core entirely over to Moopin 64 next, and that core's default settings got Smash Bros to the most playable config I was able to find, but let me know in the comments if you have a better cocktail of options for you. Speaking of Smash Bros, Ambernix feature that lets you hold R2 to turn the face buttons into C buttons is very welcome, especially with the lack of right thumbstick and I need that quick smash attack. And let's 
wrap with a little PS1 and PSP testing, which, no surprise, both play very well, but like with the N64, certain titles might require a few tweaks to get a smoother experience. As for game streaming, unfortunately, like with the H, Moonlight was able to pair with my ROG Ally, but then only showed a black screen until I exited the Moonlight client. This could be because I'm using Sunshine to stream from my Ally and not an actual Nvidia card, but this setup was able to stream great to my 3DS. Check out that video if you missed it. So it's likely an issue with the client app in the Ambernic firmware. We had mentioned earlier that that H700 chip being reused so much was to our advantage, which is the case if you're a fan of custom firmware on these emulation devices. Unfortunately, at the time of writing this script, MuOS isn't ready for the RG40XX devices yet. However, Newly is ready to go right away, so you're in luck if that's your firmware of choice, although I'm still holding out for MuOS. I gotta have my web-based file manager. Overall, I'm very pleased with the RG40XXV, and if you haven't yet pulled the trigger on a retro handheld and are a fan of the vertical form factor over horizontal, this might be the one for you. However, at the time of writing the script, Ambernic just announced the RG406V, which is another vertical handheld, however it's Android powered, and it supposedly has enough horsepower to run PS2, GameCube, Wii, and 3DS games, so if that's more your jam, maybe hold off a beat until I can get my hands on that guy and we can see what it's all about. That's all for today, thank you all so much for watching, subscribe to about the channel, and I'll see you next week.